And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ask the Theologian on this Wednesday. Wednesday is the day we study the Gospel of John at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Would love it if you could join us live or archived. But right now, we take biblical, theological, and worldview questions and uh, rightly divide the word of truth as we give those uh, questions and uh, answers, and then we question the assumptions. All along the way, let's start out with Paul, our friend up in King, Wisconsin. And uh, he asks the question, uh, couldn't Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, uh, speak of the, uh, or, or be proof, a proof text of the first coming of Christ? Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountains of the Lord of hosts and the, and the, and of the holy mountains. Now, what, uh, uh, Paul is speaking of here is these words right here, I am returned. How do you return if you've never been there before? Good comments and question by uh, Paul in King, Wisconsin. Uh, so could that be used as a proof text that there's going to be a first coming and a second coming? I have been there and I return there. Now, from, from our Christian perspective, yes. However, let's take it from a Jewish perspective here uh, for just a moment. Uh, let's, uh, let's see, Zechariah was um, uh, a, a post-exile. I was just double-checking my memory there. It was a post-exile prophet. So here is what I would guess, could be wrong, but I would guess Jewish writers would uh, look at this and say, I am returned to Zion. They would say, hey, don't you remember Ezekiel when the glory of the Lord left Zion? And now he's promising to return to Zion. So I suppose they would take it as uh, as that issue that the Lord had been with them in his presence, the Shekinah glory of the Lord had been there prior to the days of Ezekiel, but now it was gone. And he's giving this prophecy of returning. Uh, let's, uh, let's do check one thing there, uh, see if... Um, Perhaps we can, once again, go to our friend Rashi, uh, who just wrote so much Jewish commentary that he's the easiest to turn to and uh, see if he's got something to uh, say about the word return. So we're going here to uh, go to the prophets. We're going to look for Zechariah. Where are you, Zechariah? There we go. And we're going to look for the eighth chapter. And uh, we're going to turn on Rashi's commentary. And we're going to look at verse three in which he has no comment. How's that? Uh, although I noticed their translation does not have the word read. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I was reading ahead. Uh, I will return to Zion. I will dwell in the midst. Um, so he does not, uh, you know, it, it, this is interesting. Um, verse four, old men shall yet sit in the streets of Jerusalem and each man with his staff in his hand because of his age and the city shall be filled with joys of boys and girls playing in the streets. Uh, many, many Jews, not all of them, but many Jews would say this has been fulfilled today. And it is kind of fun, I guess you would say, to uh, go into the streets of uh, old Jerusalem and see old men sitting there with their cane and little children playing around about them. And it's just almost too much not to say, hey, look at Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, actually. And then look, uh, look what's happening today. So I, I think that there are some Jews who would say, look, he has returned. This has been fulfilled. You can go to Jerusalem today and find old men with their cane and right around them, boys and girls are playing in the streets. Now, uh, so, so all of that to say, there is some discrepancy on when is this fulfilled? 
of course, uh, I think we would look at it more closely and probably make this a millennial passage than we would anything today or anything that happened from Zachariah's day unto our day. And uh, we would put this. Now, the, th- the thing to do probably would be uh, to go back to this passage in Zechariah and see if we could take this uh, and say, look, this is not a description of today. Marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of these people. You know, that it's not quite strong enough. Uh, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country will bring them. They shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Obviously, it's looking like new covenant kind of stuff. Uh, and, and you and I would argue that, you know, they are dwelling in the land in the midst of Jerusalem. Uh, but, you know, is it true that Israel is my people and I am their God? You know, basically they live in a secular nation today uh, rather than a sacred nation today. Uh, is it true that uh, they have been saved from the uh, people of the East and uh, and from the people of the West? Like, I don't know, Gaza. Uh, I, I would, if I were pressing this with a Jewish person, I would say, hey, Zechariah is promising far more than has ever been done. Looks like that return has not yet happened. I might be able to get them to agree with that, but I'm still not sure I would be able to get them to agree that that the first coming was when Jesus Messiah was here. I think they would still say, no, the first coming is when the glory of God was in our in our midst, in our nation, in the past. And they might have a point there, uh, because maybe... Uh, maybe this is not a messianic passage at all. And, uh, and, and, um, uh, other than the fact that it would be the messianic age, they would agree with that. But maybe it's not the return of the Messiah, but the return of, uh, the Lord God. So we would have some problems using it as a proof text, I think. In, in a Christian audience, uh, the Christian audience would be accepting of it. Uh, they would say, yeah, you return. He was here the first time, there the second time. But the Jewish audience is going to say, no, he's, he's been here before. We beheld his glory. Now, pardon me. I, I uh, slipped into the Gospel of John there and used a, a passage of scripture that, uh, was, uh, related uh, to the first coming. And, uh, they, they would say, yeah, we did see his glory. In the days of Ezekiel and prior to that, when his glory departed, prior to that we had seen it, and uh, and uh, then it uh, departed. Excellent. Thank you, Paul in King, Wisconsin. Let's go from Wisconsin to San Antonio. What, ex- what exactly about sin did he put away in a reference to Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 26? In which uh, the scripture says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once, in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice. So Manny's question here, once again, what exactly about sin did he put away? Why, Manny, I, I never confront sin. I've never seen it in all my days. There's no sin around me. Uh, it must be because you're living in San Antonio. <laughs> He's put it away from my life and from my church and from my town. Oh, excuse me. You're right. There's sin all around us. So what exactly about sin did he put away? Clearly here we're talking about, uh, the uh, work of Christ upon the cross, uh, you know, Christ, in verse 28, uh, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Uh, so what exactly he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So we are talking about, you know, on the cross, putting away sin. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at the word uh, put away. And uh, let's just pull that up in uh, the Strong's lexicon. Uh, athetesis, athetesis. I am pretty sure that's going to be the negator of uh, thetesis. Let's see, from 114, atheteo. 
and a derivative of uh, yeah, it's got the number one, the uh, the uh, alpha, the uh, the negator, the negative particle, as it says there. And then from tithomai, I thought that was uh, from tithomai. Okay, athetasis means uh, a, a tithomai is to put, put it there, and athetasis is, it's not put there. Take it away. Uh, especially when it's in a verb, you've got to have an action there, so uh, not put there. So, coming back here, he appeared to, ah, this is a noun. Uh, it's translated uh, in our English as a verb to make it uh, come across well uh, for English, but it is a noun. So he he appeared is the verb, a uh, perfect passive indicative. That is that he appeared. Uh, perfect tense is that the effect of what he does continues on to today. So he appeared in the perfect to remove, trying to, trying to figure out how you could do that in, when it's uh, not, to put that into a noun. He appeared for the removal. How's that? I don't know. The removal is the, re that's more of a passive verb, isn't it? Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's a way we can get uh, atheteo as a noun into a noun in English. I think there's an impossibility there. So uh, that's probably why they didn't do it. <laughs> because normally the King James is very good about, if it's a noun, make it a noun. Um, so he appeared for the atheteo. It was there, now it's taken away. We'll go with to put away sin, remove sin. There's definitely a removal that's involved there. Uh, he, he, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I think that um, there's a couple of things uh, you could say. What exactly did he put away? Obviously, he did not remove sin. There is sin in our world today. Uh, you could go to 2 Corinthians 5.19 in which our sins are not being counted against us. So he put them away from the charges that are against us. Here in this age of grace, uh, we're, we're, those sins are put away. So there's the possibility of what he had put away. I think ultimately, however, you we would have to say, and perhaps the perfect form of this verb appeared uh, in, in the fact that it is in the passive, tells us that the action was done, but there is a a continuing ongoing action. And I think because of that, we can say that ultimately what is going to happen? Sin is ultimately going to be removed. It was there. It's going to be taken away. It's going to be a long time before this happens. Same with he crushed the devil's uh, head. Well, the devil is, uh, you know, prowling about like a roaring lion. So is the devil's head crushed? Well, yeah, uh, in time, it's as good as done. And I think that here, especially probably the passive is where I would uh, uh, focus in on there to say that uh, even though we're seeing sin today, one, we can tell people that their sins are not counted against them. And two, we can tell people that ultimately God is going to restore this earth to be a place with no sin. In fact, he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth ultimately in which all the old things are going to be put away. And uh, we have a complete uh, renewal, and all of this is based upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Were it not for that work, none of this could take place. So he appeared to put away sin. Now, uh, we're obviously not in a place in which all that sin has been uh, utterly put away, completely put away uh, in our... Um, uh, present tense uh, form of the verb. Thank you very much, our friend Pastor Barney in Carroll, Iowa. And, uh, you know, I just uh, begin to uh, think here, uh, I have never, uh, never looked up to see exactly where Carroll, Iowa is. Uh, let's, um, ah, 
there's maybe we have looked at this before, have we? Uh, I remember kind of looking at the water tower there. Uh, Barney, are you in the picture there? Uh, we are Carol. Our citizens come first. Barney, I doubt you're in the picture, but I'm glad that you come first in Carroll because the citizens come first in Carroll, Iowa. Hopefully that's somewhat true, kind of a we the people kind of place. Looks like a, uh, a lovely place. Barney's probably hanging out at the skate park when he's not uh, here with us, uh, right? Uh, nice little public library, chamber of uh, commerce there, all that kind of stuff going on. But what we really want to know is, um, uh, there we go, Barney, uh, 13 hours and 33 minutes, you can be in Taos. Uh, just cut across Nebraska, right there, uh, down into uh, northeast uh, Colorado, straight down I-25, a slip over into the mountains here, and uh, there, um, we can have a visit. Barney and I have, uh, no, excuse me, I was getting mixed up with Carlos. Uh, Carlos and I had a visit out here, Barney and I. We haven't had a visit, but someday, right? Okay, now to the question. <laughs> uh, first Peter, I think overall the writing, the writer is speaking of the wrath to come and the kingdom. Uh, what gospel is the writer in chapter 1, verses 3 through 12, uh, talking about? The language sounds very grace-like, and he indicates that the Holy Spirit is in them, not upon them, as we see in early Acts. Thank you. Your podcasts are extremely helpful. Why, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, by the way, those who uh, like to get uh, podcasts, you can go to randywhiteministries.org, and uh, when you get there... Uh, we will, uh, let's see, go uh, down here, right there. There it is at the uh, podcast. And uh, that, uh, you know, you can you can pick all the podcasts that are uh, there and uh, subscribe to them, all those, all that podcast stuff. You can, you can do it. Uh, Barney can tell you how. Uh, and, or just go to your, uh, your podcast store and type, the easiest way to find any of our broadcasts on the podcast is type RWM. Every one of them has RWM, Randy White Ministries, before it. Okay, now, thanks for the opportunity to advertise the podcast, Barney, and to uh, encourage folks to uh, visit Carroll, Iowa, where citizens come first. Now, <laughs> the question. In First Peter, which um, I just started this past Sunday uh, in our Sunday morning Bible study uh, podcast, when you get to verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not, uh, not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, I agree with Barney. This sounds an awful lot like he's talking grace-like. He's talking about the... Uh, the, the, the gospel that Barney and I are under. Uh, you know, especially this, uh, this inheritance reserved in heaven for you. Well, you know, the, uh, the Jewish inheritance is the inheritance that is earthly, physical, future. Uh, and yet this is an inheritance that is reserved in heaven. Now, you could possibly argue that it's reserved in heaven, but it's going to be delivered down in the earth. That is the, the, uh, the, the inheritance, the kleros nomos, the lot of the law is yet to be declared by the judge. That's up in heaven. And so you could argue that he is talking about the, um, the, the, the Peter gospel instead of the Paul gospel. But it does look like Paul's gospel here. Now, let's, uh, let's keep going here for just a moment. Uh, so, reserved for you, you who are kept by the power of God through faith. Okay, again, you know, uh, through faith, not through works. This is grace, uh, sounding Pauline unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, this actually begins to sound a little more like Peter, a salvation revealed in the last time. I think you and I, Barney, we would say we're saved. I am saved. Today, Barney is saved. Today. 
uh, I am not waiting for my salvation. And yet this is talking about a salvation that is ready to be revealed. Now, once again, we could argue, well, yeah, I'm saved, but I don't have the full fruits of my salvation yet. So that's the full fruits of my salvation are what yet are ready to be revealed in the last time. Or we could say, hey, wait a minute here. He seems to be talking in this salvation uh, ready to be revealed in the last time. He's talking about a salvation that is uh, the salvation of the kingdom, which is going to be revealed uh, in the last time. Now, could it be that he's talking about both two different things here? Actually, there is the salvation that uh, fadeth not away that's reserved in heaven for you, this grace salvation, but you are also kept by the power of God through faith unto a kingdom salvation. Now, if he is saying that, then again, that uh, comes back to our uh, our favorite poster here uh, to say, hey, these people must be living in some kind of transition. And he is recognizing that they individually have a salvation of an inheritance in heaven, and they collectively, as the uh, Jewish people, have a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So this is a little both and here is the possibility. Let's continue on in verse six. Uh, in the last time, uh, wherein ye greatly rejoice, that is, you're looking forward to the last time, though now, for a season if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Ah, oh, sins not all put away. Now you're dealing with those manifold temptations. So he definitely has a last time versus a now. Uh, so these manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than uh, uh, gold that perisheth, though it is tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ is the rapture. He doesn't really appear in the rapture. We meet him in the clouds. We'll see him at the rapture. But appearing is not really the word that I would use there. So that sounds like second coming. Uh, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom... Uh, though you are, uh, uh, though you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now here, you know, again, this is one of those that goes, uh, it looks like uh, you are receiving right now in the present, you're receiving the end of the faith, and that is the salvation of your souls. Well, the kingdom salvation is a little more the salvation of your bodies, of uh, the restoration of the earth. It's, again, a physical kind of thing. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, that doesn't sound like it can be, um, it could be uh, Pauline salvation because the prophets... There, there wasn't even a clue. You can't search for something diligently that you don't even have a clue that is there. And, uh, the Pauline salvation here was, was buried. Uh, searching of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which is in them, did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ, of the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto they, unto us, they did minister these things. Okay, the prophets were working ahead of time, were talking about some things uh, they did not know, which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Now, all of that, how's that for head spinning? Which gospel is he referring to? That's what we want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. You know, I think that the bulk of what he's talking about here has to end up in the gospel of the circumcision. Even though we say some things like the salvation of your souls, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Jews of the Old Testament died and went to Sheol awaiting the salvation of their soul and their body. But it wouldn't be incorrect to say the salvation of your souls. Uh, I, I suspect, and I said this a little bit uh, on Sunday, I suspect that 
Peter certainly, in fact, I know without a shadow of a doubt that Peter knew about Paul's gospel. I mean, John, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 15, remember, and Galatians chapter 2. You go there, I'll go here. You go with this gospel, I'll go with that gospel. Uh, so Peter definitely knew of Paul's gospel. He closes out his second Peter saying, Paul's got something you need. You listen to Paul. He's got scripture. And uh, that gospel is valid. And he's speaking to Jewish people there. I'm, I'm convinced that Jewish people living in Peter's day needed, this, needed Pauline salvation. We, we sometimes get confused saying Pauline salvation is only for Gentiles. Not true. Pauline salvation is for anyone. It's neither Jew nor Greek. And so they need that individually. I would not be surprised if Peter does not make you know, some reference to that along the way. In fact, it would almost seem uh, inappropriate for him not to make some of that reference, even though he's speaking mainly about the kingdom gospel, which is still theirs and still being offered to them. And uh, the time of its offer is coming to a close and the time of persecution for uh, for that, so not the not the day of the tribulation, though he didn't know that. But the time of the persecution was uh, nigh upon them, and he was preparing them for just such a thing. Uh, stay tuned for me to finish those verses. I only got through verse four. I think verses three and four again seem an awful lot like the Pauline gospel. Once we get to chapter five, I think he. Uh, he really kind of moves on and now is beginning to talk about the kingdom gospel, which I'm suspecting, but I'm not done with the study. I'm suspecting that's going to be his focus from here on out, uh, that he gives an acknowledgement to their individual salvation and then says, now we got national stuff to talk about and uh, that we need to talk about. Thank you, Barney. In uh, Carroll, Iowa, just a, a mere uh, 13 hours uh, from uh, right here in Taos, New Mexico. That would be 930 miles. I always get the wrong screens up there, don't I? <laughs> 930 miles. Um, good to see you today. And uh, let's uh, move on to um, to Russell in Kent. Uh, you know, to get to Kent from here, sorry, no results found. There's no way you can drive from Kent. Um, it's just... It seems like there ought to be a way, but I guess you live on an island. Um, yeah, well, you're going to have to fly. Sorry. <laughs> the question uh, from uh, Kent, England, has to do with uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. What did it mean to take up your cross daily back in the time of uh, uh, Jesus in his, er in his earthly ministry? He said unto them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You know, it's interesting, and I hadn't thought about it exactly in the light that you had uh, said it uh, until you said it. Uh, I don't know of any understanding of the cross in that day outside of the Roman understanding, uh, which, which was, uh, a, you know, an instrument of death. Uh, the, the word uh, staros, um, let's uh, bring this up here, uh, translated cross, it's, it is an upright stake, uh, and the Latin 
cross came in. I don't, you know, we've talked before about was he was he crucified on a stake or was he crucified on a on a, on something with a crossbar that we would call a cross. The Latins, I think, you know, understood the Romans. They were Latin, which came from Rome. I think when Latin came about, which was already in those days, they were using the word crus from Latin at the same time they understood the word uh, staros from Greek and they called it a cruz because the staros had a crossbar. So I, 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 you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you really there, it's important to them. No, he was, he was crucified on a stake. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know of any theology that would be uh, changed, whether it's a stake or a cross. I just think the, the uh, Latin language was already developed in the time that, uh, in, in the time of the first century when all this was taking place. And in Latin, they were using the word cross, uh, cruz. In uh, Greek, they were using the word staros. One meant a stake. The other had a crossbar. But the Latins are looking and saying, the Greeks call that a, a storos, but it's got a crossbar, so we need to not call it a storos. We need to call it a cross. That's not what you ask. But nonetheless, I wanted to give that uh, to you. I think our understanding of the cross is under is uh, is is pretty solid. That uh, what you've got is you know the typical Christian cross. Now to take up your cross. See, I don't know what other meaning they would have understood. The listener would have understood other than die. You're going to die. Now, the part that I hadn't, uh, hadn't thought of until, uh, uh, Kent, uh, excuse me, Russell and Kent brought this up is the word daily here. Uh, how do you die every day? Now you can only do that in a spiritual sense or a metaphorical sense. You can't physically die every day. So, that messes with us preachers just a little bit, Russell. Shame on you. Uh, because we typically would take a passage like this and say, you know, Jesus said, take up your cross. This means to, uh, you know, be willing to die for him. Uh, now, daily, die for him. Die for him every day. Obviously, you have to not take that in a physical sense. And I think they understood the star off in a physical sense. Now, how do you physically die daily? There's the question. Let's, um, um, I want to check the Greek here. Uh, Hymera is a day. Uh, take up the cross of him, Kath Hymera, every day, uh, and uh, let him follow me. So, so it's definitely daily. Uh, I think that you would have to take this then, take up the cross daily, and you would have to say that they must have had, he must have had somewhat of, of a, uh, a mm, allegorical interpretation, figurative uh, interpretation, to say every day be willing to die. I, I don't think you can take the death out of this, but there appears to be some indication in their mind. If you can do this today and you can do this again tomorrow, that means that you didn't die today. So it must mean you have a willingness to die today. But if you don't die today, you'll have a willingness to die tomorrow. Now, I do think that uh, he's very much speaking in a literal sense that, hey, you people are about to get into the point in which uh, there is going to be death, physical death. And this is uh, what is uh, going to happen. Thanks, Russell. I appreciate your good questions always. Uh, let's go to Bev in uh, St. Croix County, Wisconsin. Um, and... Um, is that Russell, Wisconsin? Is there a Russell, Wisconsin? Uh, I think maybe Russell. I'm, I'm trying to remember. 
Um, but that's an 18 hour drive, 18 hours and 58 minutes, 1,323 miles. Oh, but almost you're going to go through Carroll, Iowa. So you could stop and see Barney in Carroll on your, uh, on your way across Iowa, just, you know, zipping across the Midwest. And then again, down I-25. Look forward to seeing you. Be here for lunch. Uh, actually, tonight, supper. Uh, we've got supper served at the church, 515. We're having hamburgers tonight. Uh, so come put the pedal to the metal if you're going to make it on time. Bev's question, what's happening in Iran? Explosions every day or so. Will Israel go in and take Gaza? Okay, twofold question here. Uh, what's happening in Iran? Iran is pushing hard with the Biden administration for the Biden administration to get the United States back in the Obama-Iran deal. You remember the one where we gave them billions of dollars and got nothing in return? Uh, and, and nothing in return except promising we'll give you billions of dollars and we'll turn our back as you make nuclear weapons in order to kill Israel. Uh, that was that was the uh, Iran deal. Fortunately, President Trump got us out of it. It is almost uh, unconscionable that anybody uh, would uh, any anybody who loves America forget Israel for a moment. If you love America, you hate the Iran deal. The Iran deal puts America in jeopardy. You get a nuclear Iran, and 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 uh, there is, I'll go ahead and say, an exi existential threat to the United States of America. Uh, maybe I'm exaggerating slightly there, uh, but a nuclear Iran is anti-American. And so th those who support a nuclear Iran or the Iran uh, nuclear deal, the Iran, the Iran will turn our back and give you $10 billion while you uh, do all this. They hate America. There's a party that hates America. They do not like the Judeo-Christian values of the United States of America, and they hate it. They'll spit on those values, Nancy and Chuck and all those, uh, and Joe and Kamala. They hate America. They hate the American values and the American way of life. So, Iran is hoping that the America haters in America will get back that mwah, cushy deal. Kiss, kiss your enemy. They are they are keeping their fingers crossed, praying to their fake God Allah, hoping that this will come up, come up, come about. And it might, because of foolish voters and a bunch of cheating. There's a there, there's a trifecta of the Democrats. And uh, so they just very well might enter back into that Iran deal. Uh, now, there is pressure and, uh, uh, you know, uh, strangely enough, Joe Biden is uh, probably the most conservative of all the American haters. Uh, so he's not going to immediately sign back into uh, that deal. Um, but, but it's a, it's a real possibility that may come about. Now, with that, that in and of itself brings instability to the Middle East. Donald Trump's policy for Iran, uh, was the policy that a good parent gives to their three-year-old when their three-year-old is having a fit. And that is put them in the room, shut the door, and let them whine. We're not, we're not paying them any attention. Uh, they, they won't get it. They, they won't get anything but a right where it belongs. That is the way to deal with the temper tantrum, by the way, parents. Uh, so Donald Trump said, no, we're not going to deal with you. You, are, you do not have a place at the table, period. We're going to work with friendly partners in the Middle East. We're going to strengthen those friendly partners like Saudi Arabia and Jordan. And uh, we're going to bring about peace with those, uh, uh, but peace between Israel and, uh, and these partners, peace between us and these partners. We're dealing with them. You stay in your room. We don't, you don't have a place at the table. That was his policy. And Iran suffered greatly under his policy. Now, 
Joe Biden comes up and he says, ah, come to the table, come to the table with us. And they begin to uh, have these negotiations. Now, the question is, how come all these explosions every day in Iran and all this kind of stuff? When Iran has a place at the table, when you bring the snotty little brat to the table, you're not going to have a peaceful dinner. The snotty little brat is at the table. And so everyone is constantly having to get over there and, uh, you know, try to take care of what the parent's not doing and all that kind of stuff. And so Israel, no doubt under the scenes, uh, works to uh, ensure its own safety. Israel would be absolutely unavoidably stupid not to address this threat. So they, they, they're, they're doing it. They're doing it behind the scenes. They'd be, they'd, again, they'd be, it would be ridiculous for them not to. They would be, uh, shooting themselves in the foot, maybe in the head to not do it. So when Iran's at the table, the, the whole Middle East is always going to be in a turmoil. Uh, and, uh, Israel and Israel's partners, they're going to work uh, through that. Even even Iraq, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, somewhat of a partner uh, through all this, uh, uh, carries carries all that out. Uh, and and good people in Iran. Uh, you know, I, I I've had a number of occasions where I meet an Iranian here in the United States, um, and they almost always tell me the same thing. Uh, I, you know, I can tell they're from somewhere else. I say, oh, where are you from? They, they will say something like this. I'm from Iran, but I'm Persian. Okay, I don't know what that means. I'm from Iran, but I'm Persian. What they mean is, I am not with a whole Jimmy Carter Ayatollah uh, mess. That's not me. I'm Persian. Persians love Jews. Persians love Americans. They're in there. So who's causing the explosions? Persians. That's who. Uh, Persians might be supported by Israel or uh, some other power that be. Who knows? Uh, they might just be doing it. They're, they're the resistance. There would They wouldn't be doing it if there wasn't a threat. If Iran, and, and the way for there not to be a threat is get Iran off the table. Send them back to their room. Don't deal with them. They, they, they can't negotiate with anybody. Sorry. You haven't earned the right. Uh, and, uh, so expect a mess in Iran and the Middle East, uh, at least through the rest of, uh, this, this administration. Uh, will Israel go in and take Gaza? Probably not. Um, uh, I think that, there's there's too much political turmoil within got within Israel today. Netanyahu's not that strong. Uh, anybody who no nobody can win the uh, w- win the prime ministership. It's uh, Netanyahu by default. So nobody's going to do anything strong at this point, even though that's what needs needs to happen. So until that settles out, I don't think they'll go in and take Gaza. It's my my personal opinion. Uh, there, obviously, uh, I'm not Netanyahu and could, could be wrong. You think? I don't know. (laughs) Um, okay. Let's see. Let's go down to, um, Adrian in uh, New York. Trying to figure out where I left off here. Uh, Adrian in New York. Good to see you. I don't remember the town of New York. Otherwise, I'd tell you how far it is. But it's probably farther than St. Croix County, Wisconsin, which is 1,323 miles. Uh, Are believers in the Age of Grace part of the multitude of Revelation chapter 9, verse, chapter 7, verse 9? Uh, Revelation 7, verse 9, and this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, uh, 
the answer I'm going to give is uh, maybe, but probably not, and I don't think so. How's that? Um, I'm seeing if I have a note here. Yeah, I do. I'm going to pop that up. Uh, Though this is true of the church, it's not words the scripture would use to describe the church. Theologically, the church is distinct from both Jew and Gentile as a new man, an entity unto itself. This multitude is Gentile, distinct from both the 12 tribes and the church. Uh, This group is in heaven. That does not require that they be part of the church. See verse 14. Okay, let's uh, jump down to verse 14. Uh, Sir, uh, let's see. The question is, hey, where did these people come from? Whence came they? Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. Okay, that helps to answer our question, doesn't it? And have washed their robes. This is in the active sense. They washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the lamb. So I think because of that, we have to say uh, that, again, in verse 9, it kind of sounds like the church, but kind of doesn't sound like the church. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we looked at this and, you know, there's, there's a suspicion in verse nine, verse nine in in and of itself doesn't totally answer the question, but there's this suspicion that, no, I don't think this is, uh, the church. Then we get down to verse 14. These came out of the great tribulation. Well, that's, uh, that that's not the church. There's the pre pre tribulational rapture of the church. These are martyrs of the tribulation. Interestingly, another thing to this, this tells us that we cannot take the book of Revelation uh, to be necessarily chronological. Parts of it are chronological, but parts of it are not. Here, clearly, even though we're in Revelation chapter, uh, uh, let's see, uh, seven. Uh, we 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 got you know uh, uh, there's 22 chapters in the book there's a lot yet to come so here we've got those uh, who are in there now by in revelation chapter 6 you have uh, seals 1 through 5 at least maybe even 6 uh, going by memory here so that's that's uh, all of the soon telos, the time before the end, and then much of the telos has taken place. We're only dealing with the last, honestly, from verse, uh, from chapter eight and onward, it's the last weeks or days uh, of the tribulation itself. So most of it has uh, taken place here. Uh, so I would say these are uh, people who came out of the tribulation, but they are, again, in verse 9, of of every, all, all nations, kindreds, people, tongues, standing before the Lord. Now, are they Jewish? I don't know. They could be Jewish. I mean, this, this does not prohibit them being Jewish. Uh, if you need some uh, proof there, we can go to uh, Acts chapter 2, in uh, which uh, we get, uh, when, when this was noised abroad, um, the multitude came together. Uh, and, uh, you know, who are these people? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya, uh, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. All of them were Jews and proselytes. Uh, that's, that's who goes to the Pentecost, by the way. Uh, Pentecost is a Jewish feast. Uh, so just the fact that in Romans 7, 9, we have people of all these kindreds and people and tongues does not mean they, they weren't Jewish in terms of either they were faithful Jews during the tribulation and, and they lost and, and they died. Uh, like, uh, what was the church, uh, you know, be faithful unto death. It was at Smyrna, perhaps, um, and or they they converted to Judaism during this time, uh, but if if you say no, it's got to be non-Jews. Then I would say, okay, it's non-Jews who rejected the mark of the beast, and that that and caring for Jews will get them into the kingdom uh, to uh, have the the um, 
the possibilities uh, there of um, salvation through the kingdom. Thank you, Adrienne in New York. I appreciate uh, that. And uh, uh, thanks for the belated happy birthday, too. And thanks for, uh, was it Valerie? I forgot. Uh, somebody said they liked my colors today. I appreciate that. As I was looking through, I thought, uh, does this tie go with this jacket? I don't know. I've never worn this tie with this jacket, but I think I'll try it. And uh, it's always nice to know. Let's go to Tanner. Tanner is, I think, new with us. Uh, let me give you a uh, uh, let me give you a warm welcome, Tanner. And uh, let me also uh, say, um, give you a hint. If you will put the word question at the beginning, that always comes up to my side. Just happened to catch it today. But if you put the word question first, then uh, that pops over into my question box and that helps me out. And then, Tanner, I would love to know where you're from. Just like to, you know, meet people, sit and sit and have a cup of coffee together. I don't drink coffee, but we'll sit and chat. How's that sound? Uh, uh, Tanner says, a question I have been wondering about was how did the Old Testament Israelites go to heaven? I figure it was through their faith in God, but what about the keeping of the law? I am going to, uh, as we do here, question the assumptions. I'm going to question the assumptions on your question. Uh, and I think you've got, you're, you're headed in the right direction, but I want to, I want to dissect the question just a little bit. So you say, I've been wondering about how did Old Testament Israelites go to heaven? You're making an assumption there that Old Testament Israelites went to heaven. I think that's a flawed assumption. I don't think that anyone in the Old Testament died and went to heaven. That is to say, in the Old Testament, they were not saved as you and I, I assume that you're a, a saved individual, uh, they are not, uh, they're not saved like we are saved. That didn't come till later when God was offering, as we talked about earlier in the broadcast uh, with Barney's question, I believe, you know, talking about I'm saved, saved, saved. I am totally saved, completely saved today. Rather, in the Old Testament, everything you read is they died and went to Sheol or to use some New Testament uh, words or words found in our New Testament anyway are uh, they died and went to paradise, perhaps, but paradise is not heaven. Uh, so they died and they went to the grave. In the grave, there was life for the soul in the grave because the soul being immortal. Uh, but they, they went, if we can use the story of the rich man and Lazarus on it, they went to a place of torment or they went to a place of paradise, but not, not really heaven. Uh, today, when Christians die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In, let's say, Lazarus's day, when Lazarus died, his sister said, I know he'll be raised again in the last day. That's when, at the last day, he'll have uh, salvation. So I would say in the Old Testament, people died, and they did go to either a place of torment or a place of blessing, and then they wait for the last day when they are raised again and they stand before the judgment seat of God. And that is the point at which they will enter into uh, the kingdom, uh, ultimately to the new heavens and the new earth, uh, or into, uh, into the lake of fire. Now, uh, and there's a little bit of division there at the end. We'll use a broad brush there. But they're raised to eventually go to heaven or to uh, the lake of fire to hell. Now, with that... You say, okay, there's the finer points of all that, but how did they die and go to paradise? How did they die and not go to the place of torment? How did they die and go to the good category of uh, Sheol? Uh, granted, it's almost the same question. Uh, now, you said, I figure it was through their faith in God, but what about their keeping of the law? I think that if words mean anything... Uh, then we would have to say that the law was given, meant to be kept, and uh, has to has to be kept. 
that it was not this optional thing that you do just because you love Jesus and you want to be obedient. It has to be to be kept. Uh, if we go into uh, the scripture in the center of your screen there, let's do this little uh, search for do this and you shall live. Uh, may or may not bring us any. Okay, I'm going to take off the quotes there um, and uh, see what we find there. Um we've got the uh, the Luke, this is the rich young ruler, and he's talking about the commandments, do this and you shall live. Genesis 42, 18, Joseph said unto them this third day, this do and live for I fear God. Okay, uh, what I was looking for, and I didn't find it in the quick search, but uh, it's it's there. <laughs> and we could, uh, we could do a more lengthy search on it and uh, discover it. The law very much said... If you obey the law, you will live. And I think that it is really a disrespect to the word of God to say that the keeping of the law was not a requirement for their ultimate salvation. It would have been uh, totally unacceptable for, let's say, for uh, Moses to stand before uh, the, the, the uh, nation of Israel and say, you are saved by grace through faith, not of works. That was not true. They had to obey the law. Now, I know a lot of people, a lot of preachers would disagree with me, but then what do they do later when they get to the New Testament and Paul is so strongly arguing, now we are free from the law. If they've been free from the law all along, first of all, Paul should not have to argue that. And second, we should find that all along. We don't find it all along. What we find is they had to keep the law. That is why, Tanner, I am a dispensationalist. And ask me about dispensationalism. Uh, dispensationalism really is rightly dividing the word of truth. So in dispensationalism, we look and we say, hey, here is a time over here in which obedience to the law was required. Once again, if words mean anything, then obedience to the law was required. And we respect the word of God as words. And we take them. That means what it says. It says what it means. You've got to obey the law. Do this and you shall live. But now we live in a time in which we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Now there is a freedom from the law, but it hasn't always been. This is a new thing. Thus, we had an old dispensation and a new dispensation. And... Uh, uh, in uh, carrying that out, we look at it. So how did, in the Old Testament, how did one of the Israelites die and uh, not go into torment? How did they die and go into paradise? How did they die and await in a good place the coming resurrection at which the judgment will be? They did that by keeping of the law, which required faith. You could not just keep the law without faith because you weren't really keeping the law. The law itself did require faith, no doubt about it. And why would you keep the law if you didn't have faith? So faith was part and parcel of it, no doubt about it, but it was not sola fide, as the uh, reformer said, faith alone. Uh, it, uh, it certainly was the keeping of the law. And I would uh, take on anybody uh, who wants to argue that because there's just too many scriptures that are, are plain on that. Thanks, Tanner. I appreciate uh, you uh, being here. And once again, uh, look forward to uh, getting to know you. And, um, oh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, we're going with... Mamaronic. Mamaronic? Did I pronounce that right? Uh, New York. There we go. Uh, you've got three ways to get here. 
It looks like 1,982 miles. Now, you must have found uh, a shorter path. Yours says 1,911. Mine's saying 1,982 is the shortest. Yo, you're right there just north of the city, aren't you? I see. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, personally, I don't know. I think I would, I think the northern route's a little prettier. But maybe not. Maybe not. Kansas can be pretty right through there. Uh, yeah, pick pick your route. This is all pretty here up till I don't know Little Rock, um, but maybe lots of stop and go through there. So I don't think you're going to make it to supper, Adrian, tonight. But but one of these days, uh, either of these northern routes can be a prettier drive in, I think, uh, than the uh, you know cutting across there. With apologies to my friends in the Texas Panhandle. Nice, nice to nice to put all that together here. Uh, Mamaronic. Ma, ma, I'm going to have to work on that one. Figure out uh, how to how to do that. I'm I'm out of time, but I tell you what, I've got a a new person who used the word question. And they're going to get their answer. Mustafa. Mustafa. Um, and uh, Mustafa, where are you from? Uh, you may have had it on there, if, uh, uh, but I don't have time to go back through the, uh, all the chats there as I'm uh, reading and talking. Uh, but uh, uh, I would uh, love to uh, see where you're from. Put that on there. Was Moses the only Old Testament prophet to have his body transported to heaven? Uh, no. In, well, actually, actually, okay. Let let me let me back up here. Uh, so let's let's talk about a couple of others. You've got Elijah who bodily went into the uh, uh, the, the chariot and was taken to heaven. You've got Enoch who presumably bodily was taken to heaven. Moses is uh, a question. You know, they fought over his body. Was his body left here? The Mar uh, Michael, the archangel, buried it, or was his body uh, taken to heaven? Uh, we don't. We don't fully have the answer there. I think our Jewish friends would actually say there's a few more. Uh, they build those on some bridges uh, that they build and some tradition i think i think the clearest in the text is those who uh bodily we know absolutely from the text were taken to heaven and in fact probably the only one we absolutely know was elijah who we saw him step in the chariot and bodily go up we have we we could assume and i think the the plain reading of the text would be that enoch the same thing that uh, he bodily went into heaven, and maybe Moses. I think Moses is a possibility uh, to uh, put that uh, there uh, and uh, carry that out. Thank you, Mustafa. And I'm going to take Mustafa's second question here for the day. Is it disingenuous of the Jehovah's Witness translation of the Greek New Testament to translate uh, the Greek Kyrios to Jehovah? Uh, Kyrios means Lord. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, I am not aware of any use of Jehovah or Yahweh, which is the same word, just a different pronunciation, um, that is used in the Greek. Um, Let's see, is there a Greek equivalent to Jehovah? Um, I, I don't think so. So, so in the Greek, to take the Greek kurios, Lord, and make it into Jehovah. Let, let's just put it this way. Uh, it is an interpretive matter. We had a passage the other day that had uh, capital L and a lowercase L in the same uh, same context. You remember? Uh, and I think Russell was asking about it. 
And so whether it's Lord with a capital L or Lord with a little L, that's somebody's interpretation. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses are making an interpretation that this represents Jehovah. Now, there are some times when, uh, I suppose we could probably find, we won't take the time uh, to do it, but we could probably find in the New Testament where it says, Lord God, uh, kurios theos. And they would say, okay, this, we're going to translate this Jehovah God. Uh, it is a translation all the time. And being a translation, uh, an interpretation, excuse me, it's an interpretation all the time. The, the best translation would actually be master. Uh, Kurios is a master. Uh, can that master sometimes be Jehovah? Yes. Uh, I think that all of us on uh, any English, uh, you, know, you, you say, is it disingenuous? <laughs> kind of. But there is a requirement on all of us who read a translation of the scripture to say, okay, there are some things in the scripture that simply have to have interpretation. Is it disingenuous for the King James to put a capital L? Referring to the kind of the same, even though Je the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, uh, it's not really the same because they've recreated this God that's uh, only one rather than God in three. So uh, even their interpretation of Jehovah in the Old Testament would be different than my interpretation of Jehovah in the Old Testament because I have a God who's who's three and one, and they have a God who's one. Uh, and they do that from a misinterpretation of the Scripture, by the way. So. Uh, so from that, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give a little pass and say, no, it's not disingenuous. It is interpretive. Uh, and that, what's the, uh, what's the old Latin saying that means let the buyer beware? Uh, let me say, let the reader beware. Every one of us ought to come in and say, the reason I go back and check Greek and Hebrew and all this kind of stuff is because I understand that somebody had to do the interpretive work. And that somebody probably had a theological motive. And I want to know what their theological motive was and what the other possibilities are. Now, I wouldn't personally, I don't want... Uh, uh, I don't want a uh, Calvinist translating my scripture because they've got a theological motive. I don't want a Jehovah's Witness translating my scripture because they've got a theological motive. I want someone, what I really would prefer is someone who is an unbelievably good linguist. That's what I want. And they understand Koine Greek in this case, uh, and then they understand Latin and English as well, and they are able to take that Koine Greek word and know the mind of the person who put it because they know the culture and they know the language and they know the other possibilities of the word that could be used and bring it over and then let me decide the context. Let me decide all the interpretation. Now, it's impossible to totally do that, but that's what I want on there. I would say Jehovah's Witnesses are disingenuous in a lot of other things. In that, I would say that's their uh, theological bent coming through. And uh, at least they tell you up front that this is what, the New World Translation or something? Uh, so, uh, so again, let the buyer beware. Anybody who comes and say, oh, you know, here's a Bible. Eh, you better, you better ask questions. What do you mean here's a Bible? Because I can lay out 50 Bibles right here, all of which say something different. So which one's the Bible? And through a process of elimination, the New World Translation would go out pretty quickly. Uh, and I'd say, no, that one's not the Bible. That one is a, a scheme of, uh, of a... Um, uh, group, you know, that's uh, needing to support their ideology. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, Mustafa, and uh, good to uh, good to see you. Uh, and uh, let me see. Uh, I'm about to leave. I'm out of time here. 
Mamero neck. Adrian's helping me. Mamera neck. Mamera neck? Did I get it? Mam mare o neck. Mamera neck. Now the only problem is where do I, is it Mamaronic or Mamaronek or Mamaronek? As I was, I'm going to go with Mamaronek. Give, give me, I tell you what, Adrian, as I close the program, give me a, uh, uh, on the scale of uh, one to five, five being the best, one being the worst, Mamaronek, how close did I get? Scale of one to five. American Indian for where the fresh and salt waters meet. Ah, that's interesting. Mare, mar, the Latin word mar is ocean. Mamar, salt water. Mamara neck. Uh, there's a lot of neck stuff up there, isn't there? Uh, long neck and skinny neck. And I, I vaguely remember that. Uh, neck must be a meeting place. I don't know where the head comes to the body. A neck? I don't know. Mamara neck. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for all that. Okay, I I got so many good questions and uh, and so little time. Uh, oh, perfect, Mamaronek. Let's all meet in Mamar where the salt water meets the fresh water. <laughs> we'll meet there, Mamaronek. I got it. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Okay, sorry for the rest of you that I got to leave off uh, some questions. Uh, let's see. We've got a new special at Dispensational Publishing. I'm, I'm looking to see if it's up here. It might not be. Uh, a Dispensational Synopsis of the New Testament. We've had this before. Uh, no, we still got John Adams. So if you want John Adams, now's the time to do it. That's going away quickly. Uh, but... Uh, uh, a dispensational synopsis of the New Testament is coming. It's a cheap book anyway, and it's going to be 30% off. So, hey, this is the time. If you don't have that book, it's a good one. Um, and uh, and uh, tonight, 6 p.m., I'll be studying the Gospel of John. Look forward to you. If you can make it from Maranek or any other place, uh, by 5.15, we'll have hamburgers. 6.15, 6 o'clock, excuse me, 6 o'clock uh, Mountain Time. Look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, here. God bless you. And uh, we, uh, my friends, shall see you soon. <laughs>